Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Microphone is on. Hello. My name is Christoph Musenbrock. I'm from Etherisk, and I want to talk to you on standardized protocols for decentralized insurance. As you know, Etherisk is building decentralized insurance, and uh, decentralized insurance, uh, of course, has many participants which have to interact with each other. And this has to be organized in some way. And that's where we use protocols for. Why protocol? A protocol is basically a standard which enables people to communicate. You see Angela Merkel and the Queen, and they are coming from very different cultural backgrounds. And so it's not re very easy to communicate, uh, but there is a protocol, and this helps them to find the right way. Uh, and uh, another thing is. Uh, protocols enable communication. The other thing is also uh, we have protocols uh, which are very important for security. Look at this example. You know all this famous flight uh, from uh, Captain Sullenberger who managed to land uh, Boeing on the Hudson River. And uh, why was this possible? Uh, they had birds in their engine and all engine at once stopped. And this was an, clearly an, an emergency situation. And uh, there were hundreds of people on this plane, and uh, such a situation creates much pressure. And uh, the only way to manage such a situation is that they use protocols in their cockpit communication. So every single step in the communication is according to a predefined pattern which has been trained times and times and times again, and so it went basically automatically. And this was the reason why we could uh, manage such a, an emergency situation. So protocols ensure communication and, uh, of course, in insurance, which is a very critical business, uh, we need protocols to uh, ensure the communication between participants. Now, what are our requirements for good protocols? We want to build a standard for protocols for uh, interaction between participants in an insurance network. These participants can be customers, this can be service providers like oracles, data providers, uh, actu um, actuaries, uh, this can be claims managers, salespeople. So many uh, people act together and uh, to make the communication fluent, a good protocol should be fulfill some core aspects, and I have uh, written down five of them. A good protocol should be minimal. It should not have any overhead. At the same time, which is nearly contradictory, it should be complete. So it should cover mostly the main cases which can occur, and it should not be left open any space for, uh, for uh, friction. It should be robust. So if there are any errors or some participant is not behaving exactly according to the protocol, this should not uh, stop the whole process. So uh, a protocol should be robust. It should be layered. So it should be from a simple uh, generic uh, layer to more complicated and connected layers. And it should be accepted. A protocol makes only sense if everybody agrees on it. And yeah, we have a perfect example. The REC20 token standard is such a protocol. It is minimal because it only contains, I think, uh, six functions and two events, and that's all. And you know, you can build a whole economy on such a simple protocol. It's complete because you, everything you need to manage a token is in it. And basically, it is only one function, the transfer function, which uh, makes it running. All the other functions are uh, more uh, to, to, to get it, uh, to, in to initiate it or to get information, but the transfer function is uh, the, the most important. And so you have a very minimal set. It's robust because uh, you have very few input parameters, and so uh, it is main, uh, mainly impossible to, uh, to go uh, uh, against the rules of the protocol. And it's secure because uh, it is not possible to manipulate the balance of a token if it's done correctly. It's very secure. It's layered also because on top of the REC20 token, you can now build, for example, uh, 0x exchange, or on top of this, again, uh, other exchange protocols. So the REC20 token is, uh, I think, in the middle. Below, there is solidity. There are uh, standards like self-measure. We will see this in another example. And it's accepted. Everybody uses this, of course. 
And we want to do the same for insurance. Insurance is a bit more complicated than a simple token, but uh, the idea is uh, basically the same. We have a very low technical layer, which is dark gray. It's the Ethereum client implementation with parity and guess, or other clients. Uh, then on top of this, we have the EVM, which is in between. We have a formalized semantics of the EVM. Uh, I think uh, there was one talk about this, uh, which is great. You can now formally prove properties of the EVM. And then on top of the EVM, we have higher order languages, Solidity, Viper, Haskell, whatever. And uh, th there is uh, a small gap between this because uh, the lower two layers are very closely connected and basically you can separate them. But uh, then the higher order languages are already a choice. You can choose Solidity, you can choose Viper. It's uh, uh, mostly used uh, Solidity, but of course you can do uh, other languages as well. So this is not hardly connected, but only a weak connection. And on top of the higher order languages, then we have coding practices, security standards, libraries, and of course, we have the first business standards like the REC20 token, which I would count as a technical layer, uh, but also has some connection to the business layer. And then, again, a gap. And then the green layers are already the business layers. In our uh, architecture, we have first a uh, layer which is still very generic and does not know business verticals. It's a business process engine uh, which uh, follows uh, maybe some standard. BPMN2 is already a very widely accepted standard. It also has a clear semantics. And so you can prove uh, properties of such uh, business processes in such an engine. Uh, and then on top of the business process engine, which uh, is still generic, then there come uh, the first uh, financial processes. For example, payments, assets, data, identity, KYC procedures, and governance procedures, uh, which are needed by mainly all financial processes on uh, which we know. And then we have the verticals, insurance, banking, and others, and uh, now the, these can already interact by using these uh, atomic processes and standards because every insurance needs a bank account, uh, it has funds to manage, uh, it needs an asset management, and of course KYC, for example, is very widely needed for everybody, and uh, one of the big advantages would be that uh, you could use a customer which is uh, identified once in every other business because you just uh, reuse his uh, identification and his uh, certification of his identity. So we have these uh, verticals now, and then, of course, every company can build uh, proprietary extensions on top of it, for example, risk models or uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the core uh, insurance products, which are different from each uh, company. But they are still on a very generic framework, and our goal is to develop this framework. We have already an example for this, and we want to generalize it, we want to extend it, and we want to invite all of you to work on this, to make your own extensions, and to, uh, ex uh, to make this a very generally accepted standard. So this is our strategy. We want to open source the whole protocol. It should not be a proprietary protocol, but it should be open sourced, and it should evolve as a work of many in a community. The first example is our flight delay. Maybe you've heard about it. We uh, have the first uh, licensed insurance on a blockchain, uh, which is working completely on a blockchain. I must uh, uh, specify this because others have already uh, made some uh, pro uh, project, uh, protocols and products uh, for insurance on blockchain, but they are not processing the whole thing on blockchain. We do. We have the complete process on blockchain, and you uh, can now see uh, the layers. You have a very low level, level, the controller registry, which is uh, still on a technical layer. It is a contract where you can register other contracts and you can uh, store the addresses and the interfaces of these contracts. So by looking in the registry, everybody can see how to interact with the upper layers. The next layer is still also generic. It is an access controller database and a ledger. We separate these three components because it's good, to, for example, to, it's good to have all the funds in one very small contract because it uh, reduces the attack vector. 
it's a good thing to have all data in one contract. So every other contract is nearly stateless. If you have the need to exchange one component on the upper level, then you can do this without exchanging all the uh, data. So if, for example, you need a different product specification, then you can exchange it on the upper level, and uh, the, still all your policies are in the database, and you don't have to migrate all the policies to a new level of uh, the processing contracts. Uh, then we have, of course, other partners on the, uh, which we interact with, for example, in our, we have uh, Oracleize here, which connects us to data sources, uh, which we need to process our contracts. And these can interact with uh, all these contracts. And uh, so uh, we have a very flexible model here. Interesting thing, uh, again, is that we only have one uh, single point of contact to the outer world, to the front ends, which uh, is, a, is a, the connection to our customers. So also a very small attack vector. The front ends are very exchangeable. We have our own web front end, but uh, already other uh, people, other teams have built applications which communicate with our insurance contract. For example, we have an integration in status not on the live net yet, but we hope to do this soon. And uh, this uh, status integration is uh, basically an app in the status client where you can interact with our uh, insurance solution. And this, uh, this chatbot is a work of a separate team which has nothing to do with Isiris other than we are friends. But they do it on their own, and they can so uh, make their own sales uh, infrastructure and uh, earn money by selling flight insurance. The risk model is a very closed uh, module, and the other modules here, the yellow ones, are very generic. So you can plug in other risk models, other products, uh, and use the same generic framework. And the next step would be to, to isolate all these uh, generic features and uh, publish them as an open source protocol and uh, invite others to extend this protocol and work on it and, uh, so that it becomes better and better. Yeah, the, if, you, uh, can, uh, if you have this uh, organization, then you can, of course, exchange a single contract here without changing the database. Uh, some of you will maybe uh, argue that it's against the immutability paradigm of blockchain, but uh, the immutability is basically here in the database. And uh, so we think it's a good idea to make contracts updatable, because as, as you all know, contracts can have errors, can have bugs, can have attack vectors, and can have uh, breaches. And uh, so the ability to exchange as part of the whole system on the fly is a very important feature. And uh, for the customer, we have still the full transparency and the full fairness, because every customer can see if we exchange a part of the contract, it will be visible. And if we are doing anything wrong, then this will be very public. And uh, so uh, we have a great economic incentive uh, to play fair with our customers, because everybody will see if we are doing something which is not so good for our customers. Now we want to put a view on the role of tokens in this protocol. We have our core process, and we have now many participants which uh, take one role. For example, here, our Oracle. And the Oracle is providing a service. It, we, uh, we send a query to the Oracle, and the Oracle will then request a data source and, uh, put, uh, and give us back the result via a callback. But of course, this process is uh, sometimes interrupted. There are many reasons, uh, but uh, at the moment we have no, no means to incentivize the Oracle to deliver a certain service level. If they, they, we pay for the query and we get a callback and it's working perfectly, uh, Thomas, where are you? He's uh, the guy. and. Uh, we are very uh, uh, satisfied with the service, but still we, we, we could imagine a situation where this doesn't work. And in case he does not deliver, uh, we have to uh, fill the gap. And now we, we are, have invented a mechanism which is a basically a staking mechanism, 
Uh, we will, we will uh, incentivize Oracleize to stake some tokens in our contract, and in case he delivers not in the time, then he will lose his uh, tokens, and we use this as a way to pay for a fallback mechanism. Because then somebody else has to deliver the data, and this costs a bit of money, and uh, he takes the staked tokens to uh, pay for the fallback solution. And this is a very generic mechanism. You can uh, exchange Oracleize against any other uh, uh, participant in the network. And by such a mechanism, we enable many participants to work together in complex products to work pr together properly and to uh, agree on service level agreements and to incentivize such service level agreements. And this is a new way. Uh, traditionally, this would be in a company context. In a company context, you have also incent incentives. Yeah? If somebody doesn't behave well, you can fire him or you can reduce his wages. In a decentralized context, you need other incentives, and such a mechanism is a very generic mechanism which enables complex products on a blockchain with many participants to be delivered on a very good service level. And uh, I think this is a, a, a basic feature of every uh, business network which is working decentralized on a blockchain. We have other mechanisms, for example, instead of staking, we can also reward somebody to behave properly. We can say, if you deliver in time, then you get an additional reward. We can, of course, use our tokens for payments, for uh, staking collaterals, for vesting, and uh, I will have another point, which I will introduce in the next slide. So this is the basic role, but now you can ask after the economic model behind this. The economic model is also quite easy. In a, in a traditional context, you have service consumers. This can be the end users, or this can also be companies. And you have service producers or service providers. For example, think of the insurance company, which is using an oracle. The insurance company pays a fee for the oracle or for the data source and gets a service for this. The service producer uh, has to build up an infrastructure. And for this, he takes a bank credit or a loan. And so the capital provider uh, gives the capital, the service producer pays an interest rate, and this is all very expensive, as you know. And, for, uh, and above all, this is very limited. Uh, this structure uh, leads to high capital in and infrastructure cost, and for ex it is not censorship resistance. Yeah? People, banks can shut up the loans and then uh, disrupt the business. And this happens. So, this structure leads to centralization effects and monopoles, and it leads to exclusion and exploitation. So what can we do? We can put the capital in the middle. We share the capital and the infrastructure, and every service provider becomes a service consumer, and so both roles are combined. And now these are interacting, and they share this capital and the infrastructure, and this is, of course, a model which is very apt for insurance, because insurance works on lots of capital. And uh, this is why insurance is such a close uh, society, because the capital requirements are so high, small companies cannot afford the capital, and so they are excluded from participating in this network. By sharing the capital and the infrastructure, we enable many participants to be part of such an insurance uh, network. And then this uh, leads to another question, how can we uh, we, how can we restrict the access to people who ha have contributed to, to the capital? And then we are uh, uh, coming to a generator usage token model, which is also emerging. I, we are not j just ready with this, but we are thinking about such a model. Gnosis has it. Another very well-known project, which I don't want to speak out, has it. And uh, so I think general usage tokens are very apt for such a model with a shared capital and shared infrastructure, and uh, we will elaborate on this and uh, hope we will soon be able to uh, present more details on this. Basically, uh, if the capital is outside of such a network, the heart is outside. This is a, uh, an artificial heart, and we are moving the heart inside. So we hope that this is a more convenient and more decentralized solution and uh, that we are working on. And of course, this takes a big community. Community building is uh, important. We have lots of challenges. 
And so uh, we hope that we will see adoption of our network. We are, this is our core business, to talk to people, to, in, uh, to invite people to, uh, to participate in this network. And this is an emergent process. We can't, uh, we can't control this completely. So we don't want to control it. We want that this is an emergent process, and this is a work of many. And so I want to close with this picture. Many people building on one house. It's a complicated process. It's not easy. But uh, as you know, it can happen. And we are happy to be part of this. Thank you very much for your attention. And <laughs> see you.